Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's Jamaica Plain Historical Society presentation. My name is Gretchen Grosier uh, from the JP Historical Society. And we are here with Anthony Mitchell Samarco to talk about his new book, Jamaica, well, new ish book, Jamaica Plain Through Time. But since we have a captive audience, I have a quick presentation to run through. We're very excited to have partnered with our local bookstore, a woman-owned bookstore here in Jamaica Plain, Paper Cuts. They're offering a 20% discount on the book. So the email that you got with the Zoom link also has a link that you can use to order the book. It's 20% uh, off if you use the code JPHS20. So we'll put that link in the chat in a little while as well. So we hope that you will support our local bookstore, support, get this great book and uh, and it will be a win-win situation. We also have a few more uh, uh, events coming up this spring, all virtual. Um, so we hope that you'll join us at one of those. Next week, we have Heather Clark, who's the author of Sil Sil uh, Red Comet, The Short Life and Blazing Path of Sylvia Plath. That book, that talk was supposed to be last month. We had to postpone it because she got invited to an award ceremony. She didn't win, but she was nominated. Um, and it was supposed to be a Women's History Month event last month. Now it's a National Poetry Month event. So that's it uh, next week. We have a talk that got postponed from February uh, and has been in the works for a while. This one was actually postponed from last year when we went virtual. And that's the remarkable photos of Leon Abdalian. So it, Aaron Schmidt from the Boston Public Library Special Collections will talk about this remarkable um, photographer who is an immigrant to Jamaica Plain and took amazing photographs worked for the T his entire life, but also took photographs and then became a pretty well-known photographer. That's Sunday, the, 8th, the 25th. And then finally in May, we have a book uh, talk, Boston's oldest buildings and where to find them. The city archeologist Joe Bagley just published that and that'll be our preservation month event. And that's on the May, May 25th. And just to remind you, you can sign up for anything on, at jphs.org, our website at the events page, which is slash events. And you also see our walking tours listed there. They're starting on May 22nd. So there'll be one every Saturday throughout the summer. Oops. And then just a few other ways if you want to participate with the JP Historical Society, you can sign up for our monthly newsletter. We send that out at the beginning of each month. You can follow us on social media where we post various items of interest for people who like JP history. And you can always become a JPHS member. And all of that is available at our website. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce Anthony Samarco. He is an inestimable asset to history in Boston. He's published, we just I just checked, over 80 books at this point. I appreciate the fact that he has a degree in history, a, a bachelor's degree in history. I have one too. Um, he started writing in 1995 and has done so many different topics and has spoken for the JPHS on so many different topics. Howard Johnson's Forest Hill Cemetery, Jamaica Plain in different eras and different guises. So we're quite happy to have him here tonight. Wish we could be in person, but we will do our best to be uh, here in Zoom. So. Without further ado, I give you Anthony. Oh, and I forgot to say, please put your questions in the Q&A section. It's at the bottom of your screen. Uh, and at the end of the talk, we'll get through as many questions as we can. Thanks, everybody. Take it Great. away, Anthony. Thank you. Well, one of the things is I want to thank you all for coming onto Zoom this evening. Uh, I think Zoom has become a new outlet for lectures. And in many instances, I've done this over the last year many, many times. But it's an interesting aspect of researching local history. Since the pandemic, I've done eight books. Um, it sounds like a great topic for one of the things for a school paper. What did you do on your COVID-19 break? Well, the idea in some ways is that the new book series through time is being published by um, Font Hill Media, which is in London. Alan Sutton, who started the Arcadia series, which is the sepia tone covers of every city, town and village in the United States, is now basically his new topic through time. And over the last year, I've actually done not just Back Bay through time, Beacon Hill through time, Brighton and Alston through time, East Boston through time, Jamaica Plain through time, 
Kenmore Square and the Fenway through time, but I've also begun to do a whole new series of books, which are basically history books on how Boston celebrates holidays. So over the last year and a half, I've written not just Christmas traditions in Boston, Thanksgiving traditions in Boston, as well as, of course, the one that came out a month ago, Easter traditions in Boston, and for next Valentine's Day, my book, Valentine's Day Traditions in Boston, will be available. They're fun. They're beautifully illustrated, and they're in color. And the idea is, in some ways, that local history, which I find personally fascinating, is something that, in many ways, it melds the two between people that have lived in a community for generations and those of us that might just basically have only lived there for a short period of time. So whether we're a townie or a newcomer, we basically both begin to realize that local history is that great equalizer and that we can find fascination on all aspects of history. Well, Jamaica Plain Through Time was something that when I wrote it, I wrote it in honor of a man named Henry Scannell. He's not only a resident of Jamaica Plain, a member of the Jamaica Plain Historical Society, but he was a research librarian at the Boston Public Library for decades. He was the go-to person. And when I wrote this book, I tried in some ways, not just to actually chronicle and photographs the history of Jamaica Plain, but I also tried in some ways to show how it evolved and in photographs that were newer and that had not been published previously. The photographs would actually have an accompanying contemporary photograph by Peter Kingman, who has been a photographer and working with me on the Through Time series for the last year and a half now. But seen here on the cover, we begin to realize that the very center of what is today modern day Jamaica Plain is, of course, Monument Square. And not just the Civil War monument, Civil War monument at the top with the Lauren Greenhouse House in the distance, but as we see it in 2020. Well, the whole concept here is that Jamaica Plain through time is something that really does, and why is this not moving? Okay, we have to do that. The Jamaica Plain is something that has evolved since the 17th century when Massachusetts Bay Colony was settled by the Puritans. And in that instance, throughout the 1630 to 1700 period, the Jamaica end of Roxbury was how people perceived and actually called the area that we know of as the neighborhood of Jamaica Plain. This is a painting from the mid 19th century that actually shows the estate of Captain Charles Brewer. It's in the very center. And if one looks to the left, you can actually see an edge of the Jamaica pond. But Brewer was one of the many wealthy Roxbury merchants in the period of the 18th and 19th century that called Roxbury, Jamaica Plain, Roslindale, and present day West Roxbury home. He was a man who made a fortune supplying whaling uh, going ships and general merchandise. And he was also involved in the Hawaiian sugarcane industry. And as we all know, Dole Pineapple derives itself from, of course, Mr. Dole, who came from Jamaica Plain. But in the 17th and 18th century, we would see Jamaica Plain as being a place with large farms that was accessible, not just to the Roxbury Meeting House, but also to downtown Boston via the Neck. Many of the houses were typical of what was being built and called first period houses, such as the Curtis House. And this house, which actually survived until about 1888, was at the corner of present day La Martine and Paul Gore Street. And the Curtis family, William and Sarah Elliot Curtis, she being a sister of the Apostle Elliot, were a great example of people that not only lived here and of course their descendants for generations, but that it would survive into the period of our grandparents. During the period of the 18th century, it wasn't just the farms like the Curtis farm, but it include magnificent estates such as Bromley Vale. The Lowell family, for which we owe tremendous debt for the Lowell Institute, as well as the Lowell Lecture Series, actually had their 14 country estate, acre estate, in what is today Jamaica Plain. And seen here, this was something that not only uh, John Amory Lowell would use, but his son, right up to the period of the turn of the 20th century. The estate had greenhouses, a windmill, and a folly, which was a tower, a ruined castle, which replicated in a far smaller scale the great English estates. 
And in this instance, the Lowells began to introduce not just agricultural advancement, but also horticultural experimentation. We also began to see such houses as the Curtis Spoon House, which still stands at 480 Center Street, as a great example of an early 19th century house. It was owned by the Curtis family. They seem to be one of the most prolific families in all of Jamaica Plain. But the surprising thing that interested me was that this was owned at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century by William Spooner, not only a noted horticulturalist who grew Spooner's hardy garden roses, but he was also a president of the Massachusetts Horticultural Society. These houses in a lot of ways give testimony, not just to the comfortable circumstances of moving from farmland to estates, but we can see that this house, which was the Thomas House on Perkins Street, was not only laid out with parterre gardens, but it was something that was, in the opinion of Francis Bacon, it represented a garden in its purest human pleasures and the greatest refreshments to the spirits of men. Henry Ruder would later purchase this house in 1874. And of course, he was a brewer, a partner of John Alley and Ruder and Alley, known later as the Highland Spring Brewery. And he would actually maintain this as a beautiful estate but today, it's the site of high-rise apartment buildings. One of my favorite houses that I include in this book is the Wheelwright House, designed by Edmund March Wheelwright, not only a well-known architect, graduate of Harvard and the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, but he designed this as a weekend getaway house for his mother, Hannah Giddings Tyler Wheelwright. And the house, which is a great example of a shingle-style house on a fairly large lot of land, which is, of course, Sigourney and Glen Streets, is something that we realize in the 19th century, this was the type of house that was being built, not just on Sigourney Street, Glen Street, but even around the pond. One of the most fabulous houses is something that many of us pass by. And previously, if you're as old as I am, this was decorated for Christmas in the most extravagant and exuberant manner but it was the Carter House. And though the building as we see it was built in 1897, it's purportedly built around the original May House of the 17th century. And Isabella May Carter descended from Captain May. And we realized in some ways that this extremely elaborate house, but on a small lot of land on the Arbor Way, is a great example in some ways of the beginnings of suburban development leading into the 20th century that we would see many of these houses themselves being built for an aspiring upper middle class, but on low maintenance, but small residential lots. One of my favorites, of course, is a William Ralph Emerson designed house on Greenow Avenue. And of course, John and Mary Cushing Greenow had built this house. You know, Emerson was probably one of the most important architects of the period. He was called the father of shingle style architecture. And when this was built, it was one of dozens of many um, Emerson designed buildings, not just in Jamaica Plain, but in Dorchester, Brookline, and especially Milton where he lived. But the surprising thing was that this house built for John Greenow was something that showed a man who was very typical of the people that were choosing Jamaica Plain as a place of residence. As you can see, he was somebody who not only had patents for shoe pegging machinery, but one of his earliest inventions was a sewing machine that was thought to be the first sewing machine for which the United States government granted a patent. And that was before not only Howe, Singer, and Wilson sewing machines even applied for one. And of course, this house, the Curtis House on Center Street, which still stands, of course, adapted in a lot of ways for more condominium development on either side. But as a Queen Anne style house, a predecessor being the shingle style of Emerson, now this was a magnificent house built in 1882 around an earlier house of the Curtis family. And the Curtises who had lived, as you saw in Jamaica Plain since the 17th century, all descending from William Curtis, 
was a great example of people who utilized not just the farms that they owned for produce, which was sold in Boston, but as we would see in the 19th and later 20th century, builders who would actually build numerous structures, not just in Jamaica Plain, but throughout the Boston area. And of course, by the very early part of the 20th century, that suburban context, something that was available for the people to not only live in the countryside, but to commute to Boston is evident in the Fallon House. This is actually on Walnut Avenue. It was designed by Loring and Phipps and built in 1902. It's a great example of a colonial revival house, a very lovely house, set again on a very small lot of land, but Walnut Street itself, just off of Seaver Street, will connect Roxbury and Jamaica Plain in a very high style architectural manner. Well, by the turn of the 20th century, we realized in some ways that there was a plethora of architecture. Jamaica Plain had, since the 17th century, evolved, not just from farmland, but to small suburban lots of land. And as I say in the book, by 1850, the once agricultural community had seen a significant shift in its population, with businessmen and professionals beginning to supersede farmers and the beginnings of immigrants moving to the neighborhood. And with an effort to stem the increase in property taxes to support the rapidly urbanizing inner Roxbury area, the owners of the larger states in Jamaica Plain led a successful effort in 1851 to secede from the city of Roxbury and form a new suburban town to be known as West Roxbury. Meanwhile, population growth increasing by both matriculation as well by immigration continued unabated. And in the 1850s, David Greeno developed the south section of his estate into four streets. And shortly afterwards, he sold land along the east side of the railroad tracks for the new Jamaica Plain Gas and Light Company. And in 1857, the new West Roxbury Railroad Company extended their street line, car line to a depot on South Street and at the site of today's public housing development. This was what led to the streetcar suburbs of Boston. And we would see Jamaica Plain as a neighborhood that actually included Roslindale, West Roxbury, was part of the overall development. And they would be annexed to the city of Boston in 1874. Residential development was important, and it would include not just many of the grand houses we just saw, but two family houses and three deckers. And as the population began to become more diverse, many of the clubs would actually go the gamut of both ethnic as well as even religious. But one of the club, clubs that included many people was the Jamaica Club. And this building designed by John Fox, who was the father of stick style architecture, was built at the corner of Green and Rockview Streets. And in this instance, it was something that allowed people as you can see here, to play billiards, card games, and to socialize, as well as dances and sorts of things. But the whole idea was in this period, roughly from 1885 to 1925, Jamaica Plains population would triple. And the reason was, in some ways, accessibility to Boston, initially by the railroad, later by streetcars, and then by the Boston Elevated Railway. Some of these clubs included the Elliott Hall on Elliott Street, and today, of course, the Footlight Club, which was founded in 1877, continues to offer, or at least had until the pandemic, all sorts of performances, plays, and musicals. And built in 1832, this is a great example of a building that has been reused for generations, and of course, still continues in this day to be an important part of the uh, uh, educational as well as entertainment fields. But it also would see in many ways a diversity of religion. Initially, of course, Jamaica Plain was part of Roxbury. They actually would worship at the first parish church on Roxbury's Meeting House Hill. But by the 19th century, Jamaica Plain, which had what was called the first church in Jamaica Plain, would actually be a place which would later be replaced by this, Nathaniel Bradley's Stone Church, built in 1854 at the corner of South and Elliott Streets. 
Nathaniel Bradley was an incredibly important architect. He lived in Roxbury, but it was he who introduced the red brick Swell Bay facade row house of Boston South End. So in a lot of ways, not only was he a well-known architect, but it was tremendously prolific. This building today, which has an active congregation, is a great example that actually shows the beginning of the diversity with the new residents and larger places of worship. By 1840, St. John's Episcopal Church offered Episcopal worship. And it was designed by Harris Stevenson. And the building itself was actually built on Roanoke and River Streets on Sumner Hill. The land was donated by William Sumner, for whom not only Sumner Hill is named, but also the Sumner Tunnel collecting, connecting Boston and East Boston. In this instance, we began to realize with these suburban sightings, stone churches built of Roxbury pudding stone began to give the impression of English villages in a streetcar suburb. And by the period of the 1840s, we would see not just Unitarians and of course, um, Episcopalian, but now the first parish church founded in 1842 would actually be a place at the corner of Center and Myrtle Streets that offered, in that instance, Baptist worship. Each of these places began to realize in some ways how important the diversity was. Not, while, not only was Jamaica Plain a residential district, but it had tremendous amounts of employment opportunity. So whether it was actually on the railroad or the elevated railway, it also included the breweries and many different manufacturing factories. By the period of the 19th century, Roman Catholics had begun to move to Jamaica Plain again because of the ease of transportation. And St. Thomas Aquinas Church, seen here in 1873 in its original guise, was designed by Patrick Keeley, probably one of the foremost Catholic architects in North America. He was the man who designed the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Boston South End. But here, this was a fledgling parish that would later be remodeled in 1920 with a campanile and a new facade that was tremendous. But the whole concept was it would begin to show the diversity of the religions. And in that way, it embraced people of all walks of life living in Jamaica Plain. And one of the churches that is today seeing tremendous controversy because there are many people advocating for its preservation is the Blessed Sacrament Church designed by Charles Greco. And this area, Creighton and Sunnyside Streets, is an area really just down the road from St. Thomas Aquinas but you began to realize that as the population increased, it wasn't just the Protestant churches, but it was also in some ways the Roman Catholic churches that would develop not just as a place of worship, but many of them had educational institutions and they were used for social intercourse. People in that period began to realize how important not only worship was, but also sharing in that instance. And of course, one of my favorites, because it was built on such open land, was Christ the King Ukrainian Catholic Church. And though it was only built in 1972 on Forest Hill Street, it was on the site of the old Denman Ross estate. Denman Ross was a well-known art collector and trustee of the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. But it shows again, the diversity, even in the 20th century, that continued as an overlay to Jamaica Plain throughout that latter part of the 19th and 20th century. One place that is so important because there was never one before is a Jewish synagogue at Lockstead Avenue. Neha Shalom Community Synagogue was actually established in what was formerly a one family house. And in this instance, Neha Shalom, which means river of peace, is the only Jewish place of worship in Jamaica Plain. In this way, the diversity not just shows ethnicity, race, but also religion, each one combining to make a community that is not just broad-based, but inclusionatory. Well, in some ways, doing this book, I would collect many different postcards, photographs, 
from eBay or from ephemera shows. Some of them would actually show a neighborhood that was completely different than one might have seen today. But in this photograph, and this is a postcard of about 1905, it shows an area that still has everything as you see here. It's just that the trees seem a little bit more dense. And here from South Street, looking towards Center Street that verges on either side, the Loring Greenow House is an elegant mid 18th century house. But on the far left-hand side, the Greenow apartment building, which was built in 1897 and designed by Arthur Wallace Rice, was a great example of that suburban development that was actually being built with apartment buildings. So here you had a magnificent estate, and just on the opposite corner was probably a 20 apartment building. And this was something that began in some ways to see the area changed out. And as I say in the book, during the late 19th century, Jamaica Plains housing stock grew with the commercial development providing homes for workers in local business, as well as commuters to town. Sumner Hill, based on the old Greenow estate, became home to business owners and managers in the 1880s. The Parley Vale estate and Robin Wood Avenue were developed to serve the same market. 10 years later, Moss Hill Road and Woodland Road were laid out on land owned by the Bowditch family, creating Moss Hill one of the most exclusive neighborhoods in Jamaica Plain until this day. And at the same time, the land off South Street was being developed into streets and filled with houses for the working class population. By the early 20th century, most of the streets of Jamaica Plain were laid out and houses or businesses occupied most buildable lots and land. The erection of the Boston Elevated Railway was a major factor in the ease of transportation in the 20th century. And in order to avoid accidents at street crossings, it was built from Roxbury South through to Forest Hill Station and offered access to downtown Boston in 15 minutes. Well, I guess it ran faster than it is today. Well, in a lot of ways, this is something that actually would show the change in the 20th century. Ease of transportation, which I cannot say more times, it is something that is so important, would lead to this, Woodbourne, or what they call White City, which was a housing development in the early 20th century near what is today Hyde Park Avenue and Eldridge Street. You can see here, well designed by an architect, red brick single family houses that were within walking distance of both the Pro Boston and Providence, as well as the Boston Elevated Railway depots. And we began to see here this area, and this is Southbourne Road on the left-hand side, is a great example of a subdivision on very small lots of land. Some houses, such as the area that were actually on the area of the Jamaica Way, would be not only grand, but they actually came with a lot of history. James Michael Curley, who was not only mayor of Boston, but governor of the Commonwealth, including governor when he was still in prison, was somebody who would see this house built in 1915, designed by Joseph McGinnis, not just as a new house, but utilizing many details that were actually taken from houses that were being demolished in the period of the early 20th century. Seen here, the work was frequently provided gratis by many of the workmen, and the mansion had shamrocks cut into the white wood shutters that pro boldly proclaim Curley's Irish heritage. Well, this house, though grand, is a great example of a house that represents a politician's claim to fame. And we realize in some ways that each of them were within walking distance of Jamaica Plains Main Street. And seen here, Center Street, which was the main street that connected the area of Jamaica Plain and Roxbury to the areas south of Boston and would actually extend all the way to Providence, Rhode Island, was a place in the 20th century where one could normally get anything he or she wanted. They had small stores, specialty shops, of course, supermarkets, banks, and all sorts of things. And they realized in some ways that all of this was accessible by the T. And in the foreground, not only do we see automobiles, 
and the ascendancy of the automobile of the 1930s and 1940s was tremendous. But with buses and, of course, the L, the beloved Boston Elevated Railway Line, and this is, of course, uh, Forest Hill Station, this is something that was a major part of not just the development, but also bringing people from as far away as Dedham to actually take the elevated railway into downtown Boston. In this instance, many of the houses that were being built in this early part of the 20th century would not just be grand houses. Yes, many of them would still continue to be built, but many of them were two family houses such as this, 11 Belmore Terrace. This is a house that was designed by Arthur Bottomley, a very well-known colonial revival architect. And it's a Queen Anne house. And if you look at it, they have an entrance that actually shows it here as such a way that the building itself built on a random ashlar foundation, a two-story rounded bay with an octagonal capped roof, swag draped lintels above the windows and a palladium window in the attic gambrel roof. It utilized all the details of the colonial revival in a more effusive and grand manner. And this area of Belmore Terrace would be developed between roughly 1895 and 1920 with very high style houses. But there were many two family houses not far away, such as here, Center Street. And you can actually look at these buildings and realize that they still survive, including the church. This is an area of South Huntington Avenue and Boylston Street, actually verging onto Center Street and it was developed in the period of roughly 1900 to 1920. On the right is the Rock Hill Alliance Church, which really emerged as the Christian and Missionary Alliance Church of Brookline, and today the River of Life Church worships, worships there. But it's a great example of a small place of worship set within a residential district. And all of these buildings, as you can see here, are high-style two-family houses but not all were one or two family. Many of them were three-deckers. And beginning as early as 1885, the three-decker became a housing choice for many Bostonians, and they would transform neighborhoods in a way that not only were many of them built as the housing choice on that street, but sometimes the zoning allowed not only one, but two family houses along with three-deckers. Well, this was a postcard that I found on eBay, and it's called Park View Road, now, of course, known as Parkton Road. It's a U-shaped road off of Perkins Street, and as you can see here, on the left-hand side is a very high-style, shingle-style two-family house, and on the right-hand side, a very high-style three-decker. Well, the two-family house is number eight Parkton Road. It was designed by James Hutchinson and built in 1911. And on the right-hand side is a three-decker at seven Parkton Road designed by Francis Powell and built in 1911. Because they're both the same year and they're two different forms of architecture, you began to see a dichotomy that was actually happening, not just in Jamaica Plain, but at the entire city of Boston. And basically, zoning would be instituted later. But here, these are two great examples of what we would see as multiple family dwellings. And it continued right through to the 21st century. And Tower Street, one of my favorite streets in all of Jamaica Plain, has a great example in some ways of this historical overlay of not just colonial revival details, but they're utilized on 20th century houses. Now, Tower Street, originally known as Foley Street, was laid out and developed by Thomas Minton. And there was a Minton block at Forest Hill Station area. But seen here, this was developed at the turn of the century. And you can see two family and three family houses. But on the far left is a building, it's the second one, the uh, porch on the far left is not the building, it's 17 Tower Street, designed by Murray and Hutchinson Architects and built in 1905 as a double bay three-decker. Now, it's very unusual to see a three-decker being built by a known architectural firm. And many times people have to realize that three-deckers came in three gradations, 
expensive, medium, and low cost. And we realize many of these buildings, not only with, as you can see here, beautiful front and back porches, central heating, as well as not only um, freestanding, but they also had electricity and plumbing. They were the idea, the epitome of the middle class. And whether one lived in the South End in a red brick connected row house, we see here people lived in a wood frame building that created a streetscape, much like the townhouses. But there were also many apartment buildings. And this again, another photograph from eBay, shows the area of Morton and Forest Hill Street that was actually developed in the period after World War II. As you can see here, it was the Boston Housing Authority that actually developed this in 1949. These were small two bedroom um, and three bedroom flats with a three-story building, very low rise, that actually was developed in such a way off of Morton Street that included many different little areas. So in that instance, in the 30s and 40s, with the aspect of two family, three deckers, and of course, such as the apartment buildings from 1949, we also had the development of the old Bowditch estate in um, what is today called Moss Hill. This building in the very center, which is a Tudor revival, red brick and half timbered house, it was designed by Robert McDonald and built in 1921. The area of Moss Hill, the Arbor Way, and all of the land that led up to what is Allendale Road was something that saw tremendous development in the 20th century, and it reflected that aspect. They were on small lots of land, but they were landscaped, and the Arbor Way was an automobile road. It was no longer simply a street, but in this instance, this area didn't just have architect designed houses, but the area was designed by a landscape architectural firm. And Prey, Hubbard and White, a very well-known landscape architect firm, designed the area to create the epitome of the 1920 to the 1940 Boston. This was something that actually continued the envisionment of Frederick Law Olmsted, who not only had laid out the Emerald Necklace of Boston, but it also created in such a way the wonderful areas of the Fenway leading into Jamaica Plain and eventually along Morton Street to Dorchester. In this instance, it wasn't just the Emerald Necklace, but it was the ascendancy of the landscaping to create it as a suburban feature within a city. And as I say in the book, in the late 19th century, Boston's Emerald Necklace was designed and laid out by Frederick Law Olmsted and continued by Olmsted, Olmsted and Elliott with much of the southern section of the connecting parkland in or bordering on Jamaica Plain. Olmsted Park, Jamaica Pond, the Arnold Arboretum and Franklin Park have been enjoyed by generations of Jamaica Plain residents. The banks of Jamaica Pond have long been the site of estates which were removed to make the new park. Fishing and ice skating were popular pastimes and each winter ice was removed from the pond for ice boxes before the time of electric refrigeration. The Arnold Arboretum was developed on land originally owned by the Well family and donated by Benjamin Bussey with the financial support from the will of James Arnold. And the Arboretum is now owned by the city of Boston and managed by Harvard University. And with this emerald necklace, Jamaica Plain is truly the Eden of America. And as the Eden of America, it continued not just as a residential development, but also to include some institutions. Some of them, I do not discuss all of them, but some of them included the Jamaica Plain branch of the Boston Public Library opened in 1876, that the city of Boston saw that the first branch library in the world was in East Boston. Only in 1872, the Jamaica Plain branch was the fourth branch. With a reading room originally in Curtis Hall, it would later see this, the branch library built at 12 Sedgwick Street in 1911. 
it's something in a lot of ways that not just survives and the building does, but it's been repurposed in a new form of the 21st century by Util, an architectural firm that states that they, quote, thrive on solving complex urban problems in intelligent, pragmatic ways. And what they've done is to create a modern, magnificent structure that is inviting, but still has that historical tradition. The Conley branch, which actually looks like an Italian palazzo or maybe even an English Tudor palace, was actually the original Boylston Street reading room. And it would actually see this new structure built in 1932. And it was named after Monsignor Arthur Conley, who was one time president of the Boston Public Library Board of Trustees and also pastor of the Blessed Sacrament Church. Libraries were important, so weren't medical institutions. And the Faulkner Hospital, which is something that one can thank Dr. George Faulkner for, was actually at the corner of Center and Allendale Streets and opened in 1903. The building as we see here, which is now no longer, was the old Chapin House, which was actually named for Henry Bainbridge Chapin. And it was the nurse's home, but today, Faulkner has become an important feature, not just in Jamaica Plain, but it's a regional hospital. Each of these institutions were a major feature. And Jamaica Plain, it seems, had more than its fair share, such as the Boston Nursery for Blind Babies. This was a photograph I found on eBay, which elated me. And the building, which looks like a very comfortable home, was built in 1911. And as you can see here, this nursery for blind babies was founded in 1900 in Roxbury, but it was an important feature because many of these children, sometimes born in punery, and their parents unable to care for them, would actually see this hospital helping to restore the sight of the young children through surgeries and improve nutrition. And of course, eventually, many of the children, if they did not recover fully, would actually go on to the Perkins School for the Blind in Hyde Square. The Lemuel Shattuck Hospital, something that today is a arc of a hospital on Morton Street, was opened in 1954. And this was a, a public health and teaching hospital. It was something in a lot of ways, that, low name for Lemuel Shattuck, who was a very well-known person of 19th century advocating for public health. It was something in a lot of ways that represented a hospital that served a very important purpose. But today, the Pine Street Inn operates the Shattuck Shelter, previously run by Hope Found, and it's a partnership within the Lemuel Shattuck Hospital. And of course, the MSPCA. The building is quite large. And I mean, many of us have actually brought beloved pets in this entrance. But founded in 1868, the Massachusetts Society for the Preservation of Cruelty to Animals actually began. And we saw that their newsletter, Our Dumb Animals, was something that would actually speak for those who cannot speak for themselves. And it was located in the Fenway of Boston. But in 1976, the hospital would move to Jamaica Plain, to South Huntington Avenue in this building, which was formerly the Cardinal O'Connor Junior Cemetery, was revamped as the MSPCA. And today we realize with its huge addition on the rear is a place that not just all sorts of animals can actually receive medical attention, but it's also a place of adoption. Another one is the Children's Museum, which was founded in 1913 by the Science Teachers Bureau it was actually a building that was designed by Sturgis and Brigham, um, the original site that would actually be on the site of the Jamaica Pond. But by the period of the 1930s, after George Wade Mitten, who was the president of Jordan Marsh Department Store, died, his house at Burrow Street was purchased and they moved from that uh, Sturgis and Brigham designed museum to this building. And it was there when I was a child where people would actually take us to actually see all sorts of exhibitions, especially um, curated for children. But of course, in 1979, it was relocated to the Museum Wharf at Fort Point Channel, 
and today the building has been converted to condominiums. And of course, if you're as old as I am, maybe you remember the Howard Johnson's restaurant chain. It was the largest orange roof restaurant chain in the United States, stretching from Maine to Florida and from Jamaica Plain to California. And seen here, Howard Deering Johnson himself not only decorated the building with an orange porcelain tile roof, but of course, sea blue shutters. And it was said in the Raiders Digest in 1949 that the restaurant was the epitome of eating places that looked like New England town meeting houses dressed up for Sunday. Well, the Jamaica Plain branch of the Howard Johnson's restaurant was at the corner of Morton Street and Yale Terrace. And today it's a very large retirement community. Many times we have to realize in businesses, these businesses were so important at one time, but they've evolved in a way that they're no longer providing the service. Jamaica Pond Ice Company is a great example. And at the turn of the 20th century, most of our families would actually keep their food cool in ice boxes. And one would purchase a piece of ice to actually place in a zinc lined tray to keep food cool for two or three days. But the whole idea is today we simply go to a refrigerator and if one is avant-garde, has an ice making machine on the side door, we no longer need that concept of the Jamaica Pond ice that was actually harvested throughout the 19th century as a derivative of what was Frederick Tudor, the Ice King's idea of harvesting ice. And of course, the Brady Bar Block, which still stands on Washington Street opposite Forest Hill Station, is a great example of the blocks that were being built in the 1920s and the 1930s, not just in Jamaica Plain, but in Roxbury, Dorchester, Mattapan, Brighton. And here, a great example is the Brady Funeral Service in the very center, along with the Tower Lunch, the Russo Barbershop, McCormick Real Estate Office, and of course, the O'Brien Pharmacy on the corner. In this one block, we see a half dozen businesses that provided for this surging population. By the period of the 1930s, Jamaica Plain was a densely settled area that had people of all walks of life. And these businesses weren't just places one shopped, but they were also places that offered employment. Well, Moxie is a great example of employment. It wasn't just the beer breweries, but the Moxie plant at the corner of Heath and Bickford Streets is a great place that actually produced a sweet drink with a distinctly bitter aftertaste. But when I was writing this book, I actually bought a six pack of Moxie. I chilled it. And one evening as I was writing this caption, and these are captions that actually are very short, but they have to follow strict conformity. I had the moxie. Well, I remembered why I hadn't drunk it since I was a child. It was a patented medicine using genitin root, and it was called the moxie nerve food in the period of the 19th century. But the surprising thing was, in 1953, moxie was bottled at 74 Heath Street, and it became a very popular drink. And as they marketed it, they said that it claimed it helped recover brain and nervous exhaustion, loss of manhood, imbecility, and helplessness. Ah, give me that six pack. Well, it did include beer breweries as well. So whether one was a teetotaler drinking Moxie or one enjoyed half and raffer, we began to see in some ways that in the 19th century, because of the pure waters of the Stony Brook, that there would be two dozen beer breweries in both Roxbury and Jamaica Plain. Well, Rudolf Haffenraffer began his brewery in 1870 and would be operated by three generations of his family. And what he produced were things such as Haffenraffer lager beer, Pickwick ale, Pickwick bock beer, and Haffenraffer private stock. Now, each of these were important and they came in different gradations. Some were more intoxicating than the others. But one of the things Half and Raffer did was to offer, as you can see here, Bostonians the idea that a famous tap once poured out free beer day and night at the Half and Raffer Brewery. 
You can imagine how popular it must have been for the neighborhood people, but I'm sure many of us would actually have walked gladly to the half a raffer for a very nice pint of beer. Other businesses might have included high-low foods. And though today we've actually seen Whole Foods take over, the whole idea was high-low meant high value and low prices in a supermarket that is actually at 450 Center Street. Knapp Food Group, the Massachusetts-based owners of High Low, had created a well-known and popular source for inexpensive groceries. But by the 1960s and 70s, Latin foods with hard-to-find cookies, produce, sodas, meats, and spices from all over the Caribbean and Latin and South America began to be offered. Business was important, but enjoyment was equally important. And though we've lost F.J. Doyle and company with their Braddock Cafe, Washington Street will never be the same. And since 1882, they dispensed cheer from its cafe, and Barney Doyle in 1907 expanded his pub to accommodate the burgeoning population of Boston and the new residents moving to Jamaica Plain. He literally moved his bar down the street and it became here at 3484 Washington Street, a place that would later see its facade remodeled as a place that offered not just Braddock's Whiskey Braddock's Distillery, who would actually pay for the remodeling, but all sorts of wonderful tap beers, bottled beers, and delicious foods. Well, if you ever go to the Midway Cafe, you too might realize that it's Boston's best live music. And seen here since 1987, the cafe has presented the best acts and the widest variety of acts in Boston. They have all sorts of evenings that are special, live music, of course, but they have open mic night, midway of a highway comedy, hippie hour with the mystical misfits, as well as the peppermints and hippie hour with Uncle John's band as Queer Koki. This is a place where everyone can meet enjoy a libation, and of course, the devoted following by creative hipsters. Well, in a lot of ways, Jamaica Plain truly is a neighborhood within the city of Boston that has evolved in some ways as not just a place of residence, a place of employment, but with a rich and ever-evolving history. And today in the 21st century, it has taken on new meaning that we see in some ways that it truly attracts not just people of all walks of life, all ages, and all socioeconomic incomes, but it's a place in some ways that, as I said earlier, is perceived to be the Garden of Eden, a place that actually can hold to Frederick Law Olmsted in his green space some of the most beautiful and picturesque areas of the entire city of Boston. In this Through Time series, I will eventually be doing an entire series of every neighborhood in Boston. I've recently just finished Mission Hill through time, and I'm finishing Mattapan through time. Each of these books are something that we can look at and realize that they're not just a neighborhood that we know and love, but they're also a neighborhood that maybe our families and friends will come to learn in some ways its valuable historical overlay as well it will offer to the residents of the future. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed it. That was great. I'm sure people are clapping. I'm clapping. Ah. <laughs> um, we do have quite a few questions, so if you don't mind entertaining a few sure. of them, we won't get to all of them. So um, there are a few questions that people, if you go to our website, I think you can find the answer pretty quickly. But here's one. Uh, there are a lot of very large houses close together in some parts of JP. Do you have an explanation for that? This person would have expected that these grand houses would have had much larger lots and been have more space between them. Well, it's very true. If they had been built in Brookline or Milton at the same period of time, they would have. But Boston was seeing a zoning of smaller lots of land. And you have to see in some ways that these grand houses really have less than an eighth of an acre of land. They were built as an urban neighborhood in the suburbs. 
And in that period, it was something that was unwritten. But it, when, it was, when it was developed with new streets being laid out, they were actually laid out as very small lots of land. That's a perfect explanation. Great. All right, here we're going way back. There, somebody asked about scholarship or information about the pre-European settlement in what's now Jamaica Plain. And are there specific sites that are connected to ind indigenous people and their cultures? Well, very much so. I mean, I mentioned earlier the Apostle Eliot. He himself was the brother of Mrs. Curtis. And when he died, he actually had formed what eventually became the Eliot School, which was the West Roxbury High School, and of course, Eliot School, which is on Eliot Street today. But during that 17th century period, he also established it in a way that Native American young men could be educated along with the children of the Puritans. So what evolved out of that was Roxbury Latin School, but there were also scholarships given to Harvard College in the 17th century, not just by Puritans, but even a royal governor, William Stoughton. So these are things that can actually be um, researched online, and they do offer to both men and women, though they were only for men at that time, both men and women of Native American descent, the aspect of applying for a scholarship simply from the fact that these are still in place to this day. And it's a great example to realize that no matter who we are, no matter where we've come from, that even in the 17th century, that the Puritans who had settled Boston and Massachusetts Bay Colony perceived the Native Americans as having potential that they too could actually be educated. And Eliot also translated the Bible into the Algonquin tongue. So it really was an important feature. Okay, and I'm picking and choosing because there's so many now, but my name, my first name is Gretchen. So there are several questions asking about German immigrants who came to Jamaica Plain and what do you know about that group? Well, I think in a lot of ways, I, I've read quite a bit. Edward Gordon, who was my best friend, actually had done surveys for the Boston Landmarks Commission. I want to say that was in the 1980s. Um, and the concept here was, why were they German? Well, after the social revolution of 1848 in Germany, many middle-class Germans came to Boston. And in that instance, a great example was Louis Prang. Prang was a printer, but he evolved in Boston by becoming a lithographer. His lithography studio was on Roxbury's Meeting House Hill, and there he employed over 120 men and women that would actually produce greeting cards. But the beer breweries were a great example that was a double-edged sword. Many of the Germans enjoyed beer. Of course, I'm not being stereotypical, but they did. And in that instance, these beer breweries would actually be founded to provide beer for the people who wanted it. So it wasn't just beer, porter, but ale. And we would see upwards of at least 18 or 20 breweries by the period of the early part of the 20th century. Well, Germans would actually come and they founded not just places of worship, and I'm doing quite a bit on Mission Hill right now on German churches, but they also, in some instances, would actually found these breweries. And because the preponderance was that they were owned by Germans, they employed many Germans, and English was a second language for at least 20 to 30 years. Okay. Well, there's a couple questions about Lowell's. So you mentioned Bromley, uh, Bromley Vale, and the, somebody asked if that uh, Lowell family has a connection to the city of Lowell in Massachusetts. They do. The Lowell's themselves were a very wealthy family in the early part of the 19th century, and they utilized their great wealth to actually invest in uh, mercantile trade. But by the 1820s, they actually began to invest their money in manufacturing. Now, manufacturing at that period after the War of 1812 was important because we didn't want to be dependent on Britain for the importation of fabrics, especially cotton. And the Lowell family would found not only Lowell, Massachusetts, but they actually founded mills that would actually produce cotton. And the cotton was an important feature because I'm sure every one of us listening to this has something made of cotton on. And the idea was they employed people 
And of course, the fabric was something that was locally sourced, became a great income. And the Lowells were a tremendously wealthy family. And one doesn't realize it's not just the Lowell Lecture Series, but the Lowell Institute in Baltimore. They've given all sorts of things throughout the United States. But their estate, Bromley Vale, was something that really did emulate an English country estate. And if one can imagine that in the Boston area, it's quite a nice thing to remember. There's also a follow-up question about Lowell's, or a different question. Um, this is a person that went to the Lowell School in Jamaica Plain. Do you know anything about the Lowell School? I do. It's in the book. I did not include, I could have gone on for hours on it. <laughs> the idea is um, I have an entire chapter on education in Jamaica Plain. And the Lowell School, which is now the site of a, a park, a children's playground, is a great example of what the Lowells had done for Jamaica Plain. Now, granted, you have to realize they had tremendous estates, and there were two of them in Jamaica Plain. But the idea was they lived in Boston on Beacon Hill, and they would come to Jamaica Plain weekends and summers. So if you can imagine summering in Jamaica Plain, of course I can, but in this instance, they were people that were world travelers when one didn't travel that often, but they were also highly educated and also benevolent people. So Anna Cabot Lowell, who was one of the last Lowells to live in Jamaica Plain, lived in a house that was adjacent to Bromley Vale. So you began to see in some ways that all of these Lowell properties would later be taken by the city of Boston. And of course, partly the Moxie plant was located there, but also the Bromley Heath housing development, which maintained the name of Bromley. Um, do you know anything about the history of the bandstand at the pond? Well, William Downs Austin would actually have designed that, and that was built probably in the 1920s. William Downs Austin is a very well-known architect. Um, he designed the Speedway in Brighton, Massachusetts, which is now being restored. But he was also the architect of the Peabody Square clock and Peabody Square in Dorchester. He did design the Boston Aquarium, which was located in South Boston. And he probably did quite a bit of residential development as well. But that was something that was built, I wanna say between 1918 and 1922, it's built of wood, it's been rebuilt many times, but it was something that began to show the aspect of Jamaica Pond as no longer a place to harvest ice, but now it was a pleasure park. There were pathways that surrounded the pond itself, and the pond at that time had these small rowboats that could be rented by the hour. So he was part of the development through the city of Boston's investment of funds, to create a pleasure park out of Jamaica Pond. Uh, let's see. Oh, here's the one that's going to be interesting to answer. Um, where is it? I just lost it. Before annexation, did JP have its own mayor? Well, it did. Um, you have to realize, and this is something that's always contentious, when West Roxbury broke away from Roxbury in 1852, they basically called it all West Roxbury. Now, in that instance, West Roxbury included Jamaica Plain and Rosendale. But the idea was their location of the town hall was Curtis Hall. And that was something that would be used right through to 1874 when West Roxbury, which included Jamaica Plain and Rosendale, was annexed to the city of Boston. It didn't have a mayor per se, Roxbury did, but West Roxbury or Jamaica Plain as a neighborhood of it actually had town meeting. So it was a board of selectmen, three people, along with a common council of people that were elected from the area. So there'd never be a mayor per se, but after 1874, Jamaica Plain would actually have people that represented them in Boston City Hall. Um, there's a, 
a question from Dorothy Malcolm, who I think you know. Uh, she, she, she sent a little note to you. Uh, she asked about the pseudo brownstones on Parker Street, Bromley Park, et cetera. They're now sort of the area of the Bromley P Heath um, public housing project. Do yes. you know about those when they were built and well, who designed them? Well, I don't know who designed them. I, I've read it. Um, I've done all these different things that I find it fascinating. But it was actually the investment of the Lowell family to create working class housing with the green space that one might have expected on Lewisburg Square or Pemberton Square on Beacon Hill. There was central parks with trees, and these houses were actually to face onto that green space. Now, during the 19th century, many of these people worked in the factories, the plant factory, uh, the Sturdivant factory, I'm sure Moxie, but the whole idea was the entire area was swept away in the late 40s, early 50s to create what became the housing for the Bromley Heath housing development. But it's an important feature to realize that that's an area that needs more study. And I believe there's an article that actually appeared in the Massachusetts Historical Society brochure, but it's something you can Google. And I think if I find it, I'll, I'll send it to Dorothy. Hi, Dorothy. <laughs> You have a following. There are many fans out there. Um, all right, let's let's wrap it up because I know everybody's had a long day and it's getting a little late. But my there's somebody who says his father graduated from JP High in 1923, but his diploma says West Roxbury High. Would you care to comment? Well, the funny thing was, of course, uh, the Apostle Elliot had left money and land to support the Elliot School. So when a high school was built on Sumner Hill in Jamaica Plain, the original school's name was the Elliott High School. By the period of the early 20th century, when they replaced it with the present building, they called it the West Roxbury High School because it included Jamaica Plain, Rosendale, and West Roxbury. And of course, it's something in a lot of ways that really didn't see a change until I would say the 1940s, when finally the scholar, the uh, diplomas actually said Jamaica Plain High School, as well as even the yearbooks. I had a cousin, Louise O'Malley. Um, I hate to say it, she's probably dead 40 years, but she taught history at uh, the Jamaica Plain High School, as well as the West Roxbury High School. And she was always somebody who, when I was a child, would tell me stories about Jamaica Plain because of course she worked there for 40 years. But I think in a lot of ways, that aspect of West Roxbury and Jamaica Plain is something that needs more explanation as to why even to this day, Jamaica Plain is still perceived as a neighborhood of West Roxbury because many times in the voting um, lists and election lists, people are listed in West Roxbury. Yep. True. Wow. Fascinating history of a fascinating neighborhood. We like to think it's the most fascinating neighborhood in the city, but I'm sure other people have <laughs> their opinions too. Thank you so much, Anthony, for, uh, for writing the book, first of all, and highlighting that fascinating history and then sharing it with us tonight. Um, hopefully people enjoyed the talk. I'm sorry we didn't get all to, to all the questions, but I did just put in the chat. We, we should have the answers to many of them on the website. So if you go to jphs.org, you can look there or you can buy the book and check it out there or one of the other books that Anthony has written about Jamaica Plain. There are a number of them. All right. Well, we'll call it a night. Thank you again, Anthony. Take care. Uh, good luck you. on every all the other books, all the I'll other be, neighborhoods. We'll I'll be working on Mission Hill later on. Okay. <laughs> and sure. I like Moxie. I don't know if everybody else does, but oh, I wow. have a few people that does, I think. My all own. right. Take care. <laughs> okay. Bye, everybody. Thanks for coming.